안녕하십니까. 오늘 이른 아침에 이렇게 많이 나와주셔서 저는 감사합니다. 그럼 제가 변리사 영어로 진행을 하도록 하겠습니다. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Just 10 years ago, 10 years ago, we joined OECD as a full member. And we are very proud of being the member of the OECD and actively participating in the process of all OECD activities. You know, the OECD is organization for industrially most developed nations. We became the 29th member of the OECD. This morning we are very fortunate to have Mr. Angel Guria, who is newly appointed OECD Secretary General. As you remember, we had Donald Johnston, who is his predecessor, uh, spoke here a number of times. In fact, Mr. Guria, uh, the visit this time is the first time I understand as is uh, the chief of the OECD. This morning, <coughs> Mr. Guria will share his views on the global economic environment and its implications for Korea. Mr. Guria. <coughs> had an outstanding public service in Mexico. Mr. Guria is Mexican by nationality. He served also as Minister of Finance and Public Credit between 1998 and 2000. He steered the Mexico's economy through a change of administration. There was a transition period without a repetition of the currency crisis that had dogged previous such uh, changes. Because those transition periods are very difficult periods. He successfully managed the Mexican economy <coughs> without going through the similar uh, the, uh, um, negative uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the process. Before he joined the OECD, uh, in addition to this very important post in Mexico, he served various uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the posts in the financial sector. He was president of various important Mexican the public <coughs> financial institutions, including Texan Bank and the, uh, uh, the uh, National Development Bank. So uh, he was very successful uh, leader in Mexico. Now he's heading for the city. So we all are looking forward to this another brilliant career at the Boy City as a Boy City member, of course, we expect uh, his uh, very outstanding service there. And I hope that he will come to Seoul uh, as often as he could so that he can enlighten us on various issues. With, with this, uh, with no further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Korea to share this and I can please join me in what Thank you very much Chairman, Ambassador, Ambassadors, uh, and uh, we have also the privilege of several members of Parliament and uh, very importantly the Chairman of the Korean Football Association. <laughs> From a Mexican, it's a very important job. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you to all of you for being here, for rising so early and joining us today. It's, uh, it's always a very great privilege for a speaker that people come to listen. 
But at 7 o'clock in the morning, it's a double privilege. <laughs> I, can, I, I can tell you, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's my first visit, indeed, as uh, Secretary General of the OECD. Not my first visit to Korea, but uh, uh, in my new capacity. And let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, the state of the world today, and then we can have some uh, questions and answers, which normally uh, are also more, more interesting. How is it looking today for the world economy? Well, <clears throat> essentially, it's looking good. The problem with uh, economists and with uh, international institutions and mostly also with members of the media is that we always try to find the problem. Huh? <coughs> and uh, it's more newsworthy. And also, if we economists say, there is a good outlook. They say, yeah, but tell me, you know, tell me something, tell me more. <laughs> what's going to break, what's going to drop, what's going to stop, what's going to... Something has to go wrong, you know, at some point in time. Of course, at some point in time it will. However, the fact of the matter is we have had uh, one of the longest uh, economic expansions now. And, uh, you know, since... Uh, 2004, which was the best year, economic year, in uh, 30 years, and 2006 is looking pretty good also. 2005 was a little down, 2007 maybe a little down, but still growth. The only question is maybe less growth. So basically, the next 15 to 18 months, all of 06, 2007, looking steady. And it's also interesting because the growth is much better distributed in the sense that uh, the United States are going to grow less, <coughs> still positive, but less, uh, given uh, higher interest rates, and uh, we will talk about the United States in particular with <coughs> maybe a, uh, the housing market. We have to see if the housing market is a soft landing, so-so landing, harsh landing, we have to see what kind of landing. But uh, interestingly, Germany and France are back. France had a very good, strong second quarter. And in Germany, they are playing leads and lags. In the first quarter, The numbers were not good, but the mood was positive. In the second quarter, the numbers got very good, and the mood started to deteriorate. But the numbers were catching up with the mood. Now in the third quarter, apparently the mood is pretty bad. We'll have to see what happens with the numbers. But the fact of the matter is that Germany, of course, has, is now with a new government, with a coalition, trying to see whether it can work and whether it can deliver decisions of structural change and uh, the necessary reforms. Uh, but nevertheless, <coughs> growth in Europe in general is about 2.7 percent, much less, much better than the 1 percent or something of, of last year, which was very weak. And also the good news is Japan is back in the game for the second uh, year in a row now, after four years of having uh, recession or deflation even. <clears throat> now Japan, of course, uh, there are several things worth, worth him, uh, of, of the Japanese case. Number one, growth has continued uh, before it was being led only by consumption because interest rates were so low. But now more investment is happening. Banks are lending money for long term. Companies are borrowing. And rates are still relatively low, very frankly. Interest medium and long term rates are still very low. And uh, I think there's a good atmosphere of confidence. Uh, the political transition is known. Yesterday, Mr. Abe was installed as the official candidate and is going to be asserted to lead the NDP. 
and eventually he will get his own mandate, I suppose. Uh, but uh, so that's predictable. No drama in the transition, which is good because uh, uncertainty about political transition always is a problem. So Japan, good news, back in the game, strongly back in the game. And of course, the emerging markets led by India and China doing fantastically. You're doing uh, India 8-9%, uh, China, China is cooling, cooling off, cooling off. It's only about 10%. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because the first quarter, I think, was 11.3 or something. But anyway, it's going to be 10 to 11 percent. Uh, just and uh, India and China together, of course, growing at 8, 9, 10 percent, are a formidable element of the world uh, out there. <clears throat> Some other countries, in developing countries, doing so well. We're doing well, also like uh, Brazil and. Uh, my country, Mexico, uh, doing uh, moderately well, but not like the uh, tigers or the um, dragons, uh, whatever animals they are, uh, they are doing fantastically well. They're just very, very good. Uh, <clears throat> core inflation is tame. Inflation generally has been rather low, notwithstanding the fact that uh, oil prices have been so high. Um, actually, uh, the tightening, meaning the increases in interest rates by all the central banks, in the possibility that maybe there could be more inflation, worked quite well. Uh, the Fed yesterday decided not to increase rates, which is a very interesting decision because now it's the second time it leaves rates untouched. This means the Fed is basically uh, with a view that there is no immediate, no imminent uh, pressure on the prices. Uh, so, this benign, <coughs> benign uh, uh, outlook, even if it's not very newsworthy, but it's looking good. <coughs> Actually, inflation, latest inflation in August in the United States was minus 0.5, uh, 0.4. So, no wonder the Fed came out with a negative, you know, with a, with a, with a, uh, uh, no change in rates because inflation was uh, negative, core, core inflation was negative. <coughs> now, what are the risks to this, you, 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 you of course, here, you're doing pretty well. But you're always doing pretty well, you know. You've been doing pretty well now for some time. The thing is that in the case of Korea, you are not changing course. It's continuing to be steady growth, looking good, and with a number of improvements in different areas, which we can discuss if you want. But uh, uh, if anything, uh, the Korea case is uh, very... I, I, I'm very glad that Korea joined the OECD because... Uh, we can always show Korea as a very good example. Huh? Maybe one day, very soon, maybe in Chile will join us. I can show a very good Latin American case of good conduct and good, good success. Uh, so we can show the rest of the world that yes, it can work, you know, it can work. Um, Randall Jones, who is an economist who is in, in, in charge of writing the economic report of Korea and Japan, uh, was expressing to me that uh, really uh, he believes you have been doing a very good job now for several years, uh, so uh, it's looking good. Now what are, what, are the, uh, what are the risks? I see four of them. One of them is oil prices. Oil prices have been coming down in the last few days, in the last few weeks still, but it's one of those things where anything can happen. It flares up. A uh, problem with the pipeline breaks, the pipeline is blown up, uh, is blown up in Afghanistan or in Iraq, or <coughs> or something happens, you know, then five, ten dollars very fast. And uh, first, one must remember that we're talking about still sixty-eight dollars uh, a barrel against seventy-five at the peak, but we're talking about three times the price that it was only three or four years ago. So it's quite 
an extraordinary situation. What is fantastic is that very little of that went to the final prices. Uh, the advantage then was that uh, there was a lot of capacity still to be used, un unutilized. So that acted like a buffer. But now uh, capacity is being used uh, at not, not full capacity, but uh, at a very high rate. And therefore, any new increases in prices are going to go through uh, to the uh, price indicators, I think, very fast. So more vulnerability to that. Uh, there's a little better situation in terms of uh, refining, investment in refining, which is a big structural problem. Refining is as much of a problem as the availability of crude oil. And uh, we are looking with the International Energy Agency, which is uh, an agency which is a member of the OECD family, uh, to see what is the availability, look at the alternative uh, sources of energy for the next uh, few decades and looking at how uh, both the uh, investment as well as the ecological, the environmental consequences of those alternatives are going forward. But I would say short term problem of spike in the price as well. Right now uh, prices are behaving in correct way. They're coming down a little bit, which is okay. Uh, <clears throat> These so-called external imbalances. Imbalances, what does this mean, imbalances? This is it. We are very strange, the economists, you know. The other day I told the journalist, but I said, in, I was joking, you know, I keep putting it in the newspapers, <laughs> that uh, economists say that uh, gradual removal of accommodation. You see, I asked, Somebody who was next to me said, what do you think that means? Say, well, this looks like they are taking away your bed, but slowly. <laughs> Gradual removal of accommodation means that the central bank is increasing interest, late, interest rates, little by little, you know. But who understands that this means that they are going to increase interest rates, the gradual removal of accommodation? So, we, when we say that imbalances, we basically mean the Chinese accumulating dollars and the Japanese, they already were, the Tigers, and the Americans have a huge current account deficit, one of the biggest in their history, if not the biggest. And so there's a problem of this accumulation, this savings, very low saving rate in the United States, and too many savings in China. Why are there too many savings in China? Well, because the Chinese have only one child now, uh, before the children would take care of the parents, now there's nobody, now the child will go off to uh, the cities to work, or the children, the, the parents will stay in the cities. There's no such thing as a very well organized uh, social security system and, uh, and therefore you basically have uncertainty and in the face of uncertainty people save. So it's a very natural, very human reaction. And also, the Orientals, you know, you just have this Asian, Asian ethics or Asian habit. I remember I was here in Korea in 1985, and the Korean uh, officials of those days, there was an IMF, a World Bank meeting. And I was talking to, the Korea, Korea was asking to join, uh, uh, they were in a campaign. By the way, they were in a campaign to join the IDP, which only happened last year which shows you how fantastically dedicated the Koreans are. It only took them 20 years, but they got her. <laughs> but uh, you say, ah, oh, you know, we apologize because uh, our savings rate is only about 35% or something like that. I think in those days, the Japanese was about 40. Of course, then the Japanese has come down, they started to consume, and the Koreans are still saving a lot, but uh, but it's, you know, you just uh, have fantastic savings rates here. I remember Sakakibara, who you just had here recently uh, as a speaker. We gave him a hard time and said, Saki, you go and tell the Japanese that they have to spend more, you know, they, can, they have to help the world economy. So he goes there and says, we are going to reduce taxes temporarily. What did the Japanese do? They saved the difference. Because they heard the word temporarily. 
<laughs> Any time they're going to put the tax back to our table. <laughs> he said, no, Sakaki Barra, back to the table. Why did you tell them temporarily? That, you, they have to spend the money, you know, they have to help the world economy, they have to buy goods from Germany and the United States and everywhere else. You know? So Sakaki Barra goes back and says, we're going to cut the taxes permanently. What did the Japanese do? They say the difference. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the beginning of a big Japanese deficit. This is why they started making uh, more infrastructure and roads, and they started these very big uh, investments, uh, investment program, which has now, you find that now has 170% of debt to GDP, 160% of debt to GDP, the highest in the world. And that was then. So, I'm not saying that it's very bad to save. The problem with Latin America is we don't save enough. But Asians save too much according to the world balances of savings. The Americans don't save enough, they consume too much, and the Asians are saving too much. And the problem is all these savings are accumulating here in Asia. You are financing the U.S. Uh, current account deficit. And the problem is how long does this last? <coughs> if people lose confidence in holding the dollars, maybe they will get rid of the dollars, uh, maybe the dollar will weaken, the Americans will say, well, it should not weaken too much because there's going to be inflation, the Fed can raise interest rates, everybody will then raise interest rates defensively, and of course the recovery can slow down, or it can even stop. So, it's not a scenario of uh, crisis, but it's a, a scenario for the recovery suddenly loses strength. Not a good scenario, of course. We don't want that. So basically what we're telling the Americans, get your act together in terms of the fiscal deficit. They are, by the way, the United States fiscal deficit is uh, thinning, coming down, because the receipts are very, uh, are very good because of economic activity. But the current account is not going to be solved unless we resolve the great problem of um, the other parts. The U.S. Uh, is devaluing against the euro, but the problem is it's not devaluing against the yen. The yen is weakening, which is incredible, and uh, the renminbi is steady. And uh, the Chinese buy the dollars, well they get the dollars from the surplus and then buy pressure bills and then they use these assets to go out and buy physical assets and reserves in other parts of the world, etc. So basically, they are financing the U.S., as we said. How long will this happen? We don't know. It cannot continue to happen indefinitely, and at some point in time, it could unravel in a way which is not uh, very positive to the growth of the world. And that's something which we have to keep an eye on. Um, hopefully, the, the Chinese can make their exchange rate more flexible, uh, more responsive to market forces, that would be one element. It's not the magic solution, but it's one element that the Americans bring down the deficit. It's another element. And of course, uh, also, that uh, in the case of Japan, the Japanese currency behaves in a more predictable fashion. Third, uh, <coughs> so we now have the, the question of uh, oil, and we now have the imbalances. The, the other one is protectionism. Doha round, Right now, talks suspended. Very bad omen. We should get them back on track. In trade, if there is no progress, sometimes there is regrets. You know, you go back, protectionism starts rearing its ugly head, and then uh, the anti-China lobby in the United States, just like anti-Japan a few years ago, people who want to impose quotas and everything, all the protectionists come out of the closet, huh? and uh, they start taking control. That's not good for the world, and also it's very bad for the developing countries who will be the greatest beneficiaries of a liberalization of trade. We at the OECD have calculated that uh, the benefit of liberalizing trade is about 100 billion, if you include services, services can add about 500 billion of benefits. Another 100 billion if you take trade facilitation into account. So you're talking about five to 700 billion dollars 
which is a benefit to the size of the Mexican economy almost, um, accruing mostly to the developing countries in case we could successfully do the Doha round. But then there are many benefits that happen that you never know. More trade is done, more people get together, more investments get together, more technology changes hands, uh, management styles uh, change from one to the other, there's a lot of learning process. The world feels more comfortable because there are rules. The difference is a rules-based world or a world in which the you know everybody is litigating instead of having rules or that where the strongest win and the poorest countries lose because there will be very high protection and also because if we don't organize this the poorest countries maybe can produce things competitively but they may not be able to take their products to the port or to the railway or to the airport because they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the facilities. So it has to be a comprehensive uh, package. But also <clears throat> we have a problem that is that this uh, protectionism uh, in trade is giving rise to protectionism in investments. Now we have news every day that uh, yogurt factories are strategic. No government will not allow the yogurt factory to be bought by a foreign country. Of course, if yogurt is strategic, of course steel is even more strategic. Energy is even more strategic. Banks are even more strategic. Ports, oil, so everything is strategic now. Can't buy anything. Well, it's interesting because companies are being bought and sold every day. Worth billions, mergers are being bought and sold every day. But there are these cases where somehow government focused on this and it looks like there's a new wave of protectionism and national champions are being invented in order to stop these mergers. So, that's something we're worried about. We just had a seminar about that and now we're working on that. We're going to report to the G8 next year on this protectionism, investment protectionism. Those, those are some of the new challenges. And of course the housing markets. Eh? August minus 6% year on year of housing starts in the United States. Uh, so that's, that's uh, you know, not soft landing, minus 6%. Uh, maybe it'll be a little softer next month, but uh, uh, we're looking at the disinflation that is maybe a little too fast. So, what to do? Well, we of course, <coughs> in each one of these areas, we're working with the countries. We're trying to uh, make sure that uh, countries adopt the best practices, that they are fiscally prudent, that they have a monetary policy that does not accelerate too much, that does not react mechanically, monetary policy that respects the fight against inflation but also the need to continue the recovery process. Central bankers sometimes don't like to be told what we think. They say, leave me alone, you know I'm fighting inflation, and we say yes, but we are there here to promote growth. We, we of course, not, we don't close our eyes to the possibility of inflation. Of course, inflation. growth has to happen in a stable environment. However, uh, beating inflation is not the only objective of economic policy. You also have to have jobs, you also have to have... So that's, uh, that's also important. And uh, I can only say that uh, uh, my wish we had more members like uh, Korea because uh, not only... I, I, I was being told about this miracle of the Han River thing that you have. The, the wonderful thing of the miracle of the Han River is that it's not a miracle because you can't explain miracles. Miracles happen somehow and that's why they call miracles because they came from somewhere. Uh, forces beyond one's explanation made them happen. And in Korea this did not come from heaven, it came from the Koreans. 
It came from enlightened uh, economic policies and the very hard work of the Koreans for many, many decades, from choosing the right alternatives, from sacrificing. Yesterday I was in the Korean University Business School and I was telling the young students there, understand that today you have it very, very good, but that the generation before you, the people who are about my age and a little older, the baby boomers in Korea, there was not a very great boom to talk about. They had to tighten their belt, they had to work very hard, they had to sacrifice in order to let you live the way you're living today. And some of them looked at me with a little bit of surprise, you know, like saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> they said, nobody spoke English a few decades ago. <laughs> and of course, computers were not there, and uh, laptops were not uh, there. And, uh, so, effectively what you have is, is, is not a miracle, but a very admirable uh, uh, effort that a little bit more than one generation took a very highly underdeveloped country to a country that is now converging with uh, the average of the OECD, which is a very great effort in and of itself. A lot of challenges, challenges that have to do with the labor markets, challenges that have to do with, uh, with competitiveness, uh, challenges that have to do with the social security system, challenges that have to do with the environment. Uh, but, uh, but everybody has challenges and uh, the question is are we moving in the right direction and uh, in this benign context of international economy as I just described, um, I say Korea is, is doing it right. Thank you very much.